1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be picking up at verse 13. Again, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all the way, for wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Father, please bless your word unto us. Uh, we thank you again for this time to come before you, and we pray that you would make this time fruitful. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So hearkening back to last week, we heard Paul explaining the nature of his ministry among the church in Thessalonica. Paul's ministry was a blameless one. He had lived and ministered among them, avoiding the common pitfalls that ministers of the gospel sometimes fall into. Paul was free of any charge of covetousness or sexual immorality or seeking to please men. Paul came to the Thessalonians with a fear of God, and he operated for three consecutive weeks with them in light of that fear of God, which gave him a deep love for these people. And the second half of chapter 2 in this letter to the Thessalonians moves beyond the nature of Paul's character among the Thessalonians to talk about the nature of his ministry, the word that he brought to them. His message. What did this holy man bring to this church? Why were the Jews of that city bothered by what was being said and subsequently happening? What was it that a mere man could do? What could he say that would change the lives of these people in Thessalonica so radically and simultaneously cause such a rising up from the Jews of that city? Paul came, as we will see, with power because he came as a minister of the word of God. He came to Thessalonica with power because he came with the word of God as his minister. For this cause also, verse 13, we thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So Paul is found to be constantly praising God and praising him in light of the fruit of his ministry in Thessalonica. When Paul sees something praiseworthy, he thanks God. He praises God. God is to be thanked for the fruitfulness seen in the Thessalonians. And Paul says he does so without ceasing. When Paul prays, he thanks God for the blessing he has been given. And we know from the end of this chapter that Paul considered the maturing faith that he saw among the Thessalonians to be one of his greatest blessings. He found it to be one of his greatest blessings to see this church growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And that's how we ought to think of discipleship. And we ought to long for and delight in the growth of fellow believers. Seek out opportunities for it and delight wherever we see it. Especially grateful for those times when God gives us a hand in an individual's discipleship. Paul took responsibility for these believers. He longed for their growth. And when they grew, he praised God. Paul came to these believers originally with a sermon. He came to them with a word, a message. He came to Thessalonica preaching, which is recorded as we read in Acts 17. He came preaching and there was a certain quality to what he preached. This quality was that Paul, though only a man, preached the words of God. He was only a man, but he preached the words of God. Paul does this as an apostle, but we know from his words to men like Timothy that he wanted this to be what happened moving forward from every minister of Christ. That they would preach the word in season and out of season. That that would mark ministers in Christ's church. 
preaching the word of God. Now, there are qualifications to a good sermon that do not exist with the word of God itself. Right? There's a distinction between a sermon and the word of God itself. And here's what I mean. When you read the Bible, any single line of it, any story, any section, you're reading the words of God. No qualifications. God has spoken to us in his word. He inspired men, carried them along by his Holy Spirit to write a book for us. That book is without flaw, and it's sufficient to equip us to know God and to obey him in every aspect, every circumstance of life. This book is through and through the words of God. The Bible is through and through the words of God. It is revelation from God to us. God has given it to his people, and he's preserved it for us down through the ages. And this is where we turn to know God, to know what it means to obey him. Any issue we have, we take it to the word of God, and that's where we're equipped to deal with it. Images of Jesus, for example. Why are we not to have images of Jesus? And how do we know that that is the truth? Well, the Bible does not give us a physical description of Jesus. And we have no pictures from Jesus at that time. So you can look at it from one end and just say, oh, that's, it just seems like it'd be speculative to have a picture of him. But more fundamentally, one of God's commands to us in his word is that we would not worship an idol. We are not to worship images, including pictures of Jesus. God's revelation to us, his word to us, prohibits the use of any pictures of the Father, of the Son, of the Spirit in our worship. And you will not be able to avoid worship toward an image of Jesus. If you are seeking to worship Jesus and you have an image of him, you will most certainly include that image in your worship of Jesus. That image will influence the way you think about him. And your thoughts about Jesus are to be shaped by the word of God, by his revelation and not by an image. The Bible says that right now Christians are to live by faith. Our lives are to be marked by lives of faith and not by sight. One day we will behold Jesus with our eyes and made like him. But until that day we worship, we live by faith. And our faith is to be grounded again in the word of God. We know we are not to have images of Jesus because the Bible tells us so. That's the point. Where do we go to understand who God is and what it looks like, what it means to worship him rightly? We go to the Bible. So the Bible is God's word. God reveals himself to us in it. And he prescribes how we are to worship him. A sermon could be a number of things. It's not guaranteed, like the Bible is, to be true. And Paul's claim is that his preaching was in line with the word of God, and therefore he came with the power of God. But a sermon is not guaranteed to be in line with the word of God, which is the standard of truth. On a previous Sunday, you may have heard a sermon that didn't even pretend to be from the Bible, in light of the word of God. Many churches do not need to open their Bibles to track with what's being talked about. And that would be the epitome of the words of men rather than the words of God. All sermons have men speaking, right? Men are speaking the word or women if they have liked the words of men so much that they have women preaching it. But when men speak, they either speak the wisdom of men or they speak the wisdom of God. A sermon is to be an exposition of the word of God, to be a declaring, a setting forth of the scriptures. That's what a good sermon is to be. And so a good sermon hinges on how well, how truly, it accomplishes this goal. Many quote-unquote preachers today do not even set this goal out in the outset when they stand before their churches, before their congregations. But even for those who have the goal of expounding the word of God, they can still do so well or they can do so poorly. Man's wisdom has no place in the preaching of God's word, which is not the same as saying application has no place in the preaching of God's word. Application will not always be explicit in the text, but God wants us to apply his word to all of our lives. This means application is necessary. We're to make good and logical inferences, conclusions from the word of God. So faithful application will be drawn out of the word of God, not slapped on top of it. God delights to use preaching. He delights to use a sinful man before a congregation of sinners to declare his holy word. And the preacher is not to do so timidly, but with boldness. As Peter said in 1 Peter 4, verse 11, he said, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do, so, do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word of God is to be studied diligently and then proclaimed by his ministers with boldness as the oracles of God. Christian churches do not need men who think it is humble to softly lay out possible subject, su suggestions of what the word of God says, unwilling to confront their people in their sin or to declare the glories of the gospel 
with conviction and with exclusivity. The church does not need that. There's no humility in that kind of timidity being the tone of the sermon week in and week out of a church. Instead, there ought to be a culture of studying hard, studying to show yourself approved, which does not necessarily mean having firm answers on every single little thing that comes up in the Bible, but studying hard and preaching that which is clear and vital with boldness. Humility is believing God and then proclaiming his truth in the face of those who want to hear something else, something less, something less than the truth. Faithful preaching comes from men who fear God and men who study to show themselves approved. Think about where we would be if men in pulpits in America just faithfully preached simple things in the word of God. Simple things in the word of God. How much better off would we be as a culture if preachers taught the truth about homosexuality instead of loving the praises of gays and lesbians? How much better off would we be? How many churches fly rainbow flags as you drive down the street? How much better off would the church be if preachers feared God more than BLM and their teachings on racism and the nature of sin? And speaking of sin, for many of these pulpits, that's the only way sin even sneaks into the conversation, into the pulpit. Preachers don't want to confront their women for slanderous gossip or self-pity, nor do they want to confront their men for their prideful anger, their impatience, or their laziness. But they sure have a zeal for talking about systemic racism and white privilege. The theme is a love for one of those things that Paul said he was free of, and that's the, love, the, the praises and the love of men. So God delights to use a sinful man to stand before his people to proclaim his word. And Paul told the Corinthian church why God chose to do so, why God chose to use a man to preach his word, a fellow sinner. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, this treasure of the gospel, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The excellency of the power is of God and not of us. It's nothing in the man. He is an earthen vessel that the Lord delights to use. And this is so that the glory would be due to God and not to any man. When you look at the preacher, there's no excellency. That's plain. Thank you. Goodness gracious. But the message is packed full of glory. Nothing excellent in the preacher, but the message is packed full of glory. And God loves this combination. God loves people to be humbled by receiving this message, this glorious message of his word from a fellow sinner. God loves to use the folly of preaching to the blessing of his people. Paul says that his true preaching of the word of God was heard by the Thess Thessalonians as exactly that. It was heard as the word of God. And so is the case with all faithful preaching. So is the case with all faithful preaching. When the word of God is faithfully preached to the people of God, it is Jesus speaking to his people through the preacher. All the power of this is in the spirit of God, not in the man. And this fact puts a bigger weight on both sides, a bigger weight for the preacher and a bigger weight for the congregant, the listener. For the preacher, he stands as a minister of Jesus Christ. And whenever he speaks with his own words over and against the word of God, he dishonors the office of preacher and dishonors the one who he was sent to represent. Jesus is dishonored in faithful preaching because people should be coming to the preacher expecting to hear from Jesus. And for the hearer, when the word of God is faithfully preached, who is speaking? Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking to his people, and so where is your mind at? Is it drifting off? Or is it thinking about the tasks that lie ahead of you this week? Remember that Jesus is speaking. His word is coming before you, and you have a responsibility to hear him, to obey him, to heed his counsel, to worship him. Do not ignore the Son of God when he speaks, but hear and obey. Do not allow your mind to drift off. Do not treat it as the words of men, though you are hearing it from a man. What is the importance of church? What's the importance of preaching? How will people know God without it? How will people hear the truth of God's word and subsequently believe it if someone does not preach it to them? 
one of the fruits of faithful preaching, of the word of God going forth to the people of God, is that change takes place, as you see in our text. This is part of the evidence that Paul's preaching was the word of God, the fact that that word worked. That word did something, it affected something. The word of God is living and it's active. The word of God cuts us open and it works on our hearts. Paul says that for those who believe, the word of God works effectually. Coupled with the work of the Spirit, the Word of God works on our hearts. This means that God accomplishes His purpose through the reading and the preaching of His Word. He accomplishes His purposes through His Word. The Word of God goes out, it goes out to a people, and it never returns void. No matter who it goes out to, it never returns void. So for the people of God, their hearing of it brings sanctification. The word of God brings faithful rebukes to us when we're in sin. It confronts us on our sin. It comforts us when we're full of sorrow. It encourages us when we're weak. It spurs us on to good works. The word of God is not dead. It is alive. And when it goes forth to the unbeliever, it either goes forth to the softening of their heart as they turn from their sins in repentance and trust in Jesus, or it goes forth to the hardening of their hearts, but it never returns void. It always accomplishes that which it sets out to do. The word of God reveals to us the God who is the author of it. In the Bible, we behold the glory of God. We behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, his son. And this living word works on us. When we receive the word of God, when we submit to it, we are formed more and more into the image of Jesus. And we see that the fruit of the preached word to the Thessalonians was that they became an example to all the churches of what it looked like to be a God-honoring church. Verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. And this word from Paul worked things into the believers in Thessalonica. It worked things into them, to the point that they became a lot like the churches that we saw in Judea. Good works flow out of the people of God as his word is worked into us. His word is worked into us and good works flow out of us. The churches in Judea heard the preaching of the gospel. They turned from their sins and they worshiped the Messiah. They worshiped Jesus. And worshiping Jesus, much like David was talking about, many of these believers would profess the faith, go down in the waters of baptism, be raised to newness of life, and come out and face the flames. They'd come out to intense persecution just for saying the name, for joining the church. Worshiping Jesus among the first century Jews was a dangerous endeavor, a deadly endeavor. The early chapters of Revelation, a lot of you were there in San Diego while we were working through Revelation, the early chapters of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, detail many of the actions of the Jews in their persecution against the Christian churches. Worship Jesus in those days and prepare to be ostracized in the marketplace. Good luck getting a job. Good luck providing for your families. But these Jews had unions and they would bar Christians from even being a part of those unions, of those labor forces. Unable to provide for their families, slandered by your neighbors, Jews prohibited Christians from getting jobs. They sought to turn them into the Roman authorities. They sought to undermine everything these Christians wanted to accomplish. Right? Don't think of the Jews you know today who are just cultural Jews. They don't eat pork and they're good with their money. And they care nothing about the Bible. You know, they know that they don't believe in Jesus and that's about it. No, these Jews had zeal. These Jews were zealous. They worshipped the devil, but they were zealous in it. Paul goes on to describe the character of these, or really the actions which display the character of these Jews here in verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Who were these Jews? Well, these were the Jews that killed Jesus. Before that, they used to honor the graves of the prophets. You remember Jesus speaking to them, and you know, they bring flowers by the graves of the prophets. They honor the graves of the prophets, even though their fathers were the ones that killed the prophets. And Jesus told them they're much more like their fathers than they realize. These Jews were God-haters, and so they hated Jesus, they hated the prophets, and they hated, hated the people who worshipped the triune God. Right? One follows after the other. If you hate God the Father, you're going to hate his Son. If you hate the Son, you're going to hate his people. The very Savior of the world came to these Jews, their promised and long-awaited Messiah, but their hearts were already far from God. And so their rebellion against God, in their rebellion against God, they refused 
to receive yet another prophet. And yet this one was more than a prophet. Jesus told these Jews they were storing up wrath for themselves. That's what Jesus told them in his ministry. They were storing up wrath for themselves by slaughtering God's spokesmen over the centuries. All of that was blood stacking up against them. They were filling up God's wrath for them. He said their reverence for the prophets of old was all talk. It was all talk. And that was proven by their similar behavior to their fathers before them in crucifying Jesus. Their persecu the persecution continued from the prophets to the Lord Jesus and then to his people, to the churches. The Christians in Judea, right, that the Thessalonians were modeling, were persecuted by the Jews. The Thessalonians received more of the same. The Thessalonians followed in the train of their brothers in Judea. They received persecution and they did so with joy. So much that Paul calls them an example to all the churches in Greece. It ought to be our expectation to suffer for the name of Jesus if we're living for him. If we're living for him, he makes it very clear that the servants are not above their master. They persecuted him, they will persecute us. The enemies of God persecute the church of Christ. Christians suffer slander and mocking. They lose jobs and friendships and social status. Christians have been falsely imprisoned and unjustly punished and are, are still down to today. And the enemies of God hope that these things will cause Christians to forsake God. The forsakers of God, like these Jews, want more to join their ranks. They want more to stand opposed to God so that they can feel comforted in their sin. They want to walk in their sin and they want more and more sinners walking in their sin. Not having to face the consequences, not thinking about, putting off the thought of God's wrath towards such actions. But Christians count it a privilege to suffer. They bring the suffering, we call it a privilege, a joy, a grace. Jesus suffered for us far more than we could ever suffer on this earth. Impossible. Impossible to out-suffer Jesus. He took the wrath of God for us. He went to the grave for us, he took the wrath of God for us. And so to suffer for his name, to follow in his train, is the mark of a glorious life, a life well lived. If we suffer persecution for the name of Jesus, we ought to count it all joy. And God is not pleased with those who hate him. God is not pleased with those who hate him. And because these Jews hated Jesus so much, they set themselves up as being against all men who might hear this gospel and be saved. Right? They, re they refuse to allow the gospel to go forth to the Gentiles unto their salvation. They seek to prohibit the preaching of the gospel everywhere they can. And that is a mark of Paul's ministry, is it not? Is he not run out of every city? by the Jews not wanting, to be, uh, not wanting to hear the gospel go forth, the word of God go forth in their city. And we saw the same in Thessalonica, right, taken out by night to get to Berea. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So as I said, in every Jewish city Paul went to, he would eventually be driven out by whatever Jews were there that did not hear the gospel and repent and believe. Because some repented and believed. Those who remained opposed to Jesus grew in their hatred of Paul's preaching as their hearts were hardened to the glories of the gospel message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They would seek to lay hands on Paul, to do him harm, to cause his message to cease from going forth. And in one place we've seen this kind of fruit in our own ministry is down in San Diego at Planned Parenthood. The first set of guards we had at Planned Parenthood, we didn't have a good relationship with right off the bat. Uh, they'd call the cops and, you know, give false reports of us trespassing, us harassing, whatever they wanted to say. And we recognized that dynamic pretty quick. They weren't aware of the resources I had. But we recognized that dynamic pretty quick. And that typified the relationship we had with them. But we had subsequent guards who were younger and who, obviously, we would still preach at them and... You know, condemn their job as they defend a place like Planned Parenthood, but overall had much more uh, amiability in the relationship, able to converse, able to have good conversations. But as time went on, there was a marked change, and we didn't do anything different. We came with the same gospel message. 